Hey guys, this is Bobby Docio of Coder Foundry and Cortex. We're here at the tech capital of the world. It's Kernsville, North Carolina. I'm joined here by my producer extraordinaire, Kevin Doyle. Say hello to the world, Kevin. Hello, world. Hey, Back how again. you doing? Good. How are you? That's a sweet intro, but um, I just noticed Adam Brooks has a comment about our intro. Now what? Since you is he giving us his lottery off. numbers yet? What's he saying? <laughs> Well, so he, yeah, he we can't, right. Adam. I, you I, can't I, add a fade to it. That right. we, yeah, you, you, yeah, it's not possible. Um, trust me, I it's a pet peeve of mine. Sorry, sorry. Let, it's, office, it's, it's, it's a pet peeve of mine, Adam. I'm sorry. Like, trust me, it gets me every day. Thanks for pointing it out. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's, the software we use doesn't have that capability yet. Yeah, so it doesn't have really, any cross dissolves or anything crazy. Trust me, I've looked. Yeah, um, so it's just like a what we can do. Cut. It's just. It's a straight cut, and you get Bobby's face just staring at you. So right, that's, exactly. we're just sort of stuck with that. So <laughs> thanks, to everybody, for joining us today. We super appreciate it. Thanks for coming yeah, back. Cool. Um, we have a lot of uh, a lot of people back with us again. Just do yeah. a few hey's. We have Glenn back. Hey, Glenn. Uh, Beth's back. Happy Tuesday. Hey, happy Tuesday. Uh, what do we have? MSV's back, too. Um, what do we have? Tia's back. John's back. Hey, John. Um, what do we have here? I don't reckon. Uh, I don't recognize Vandit, so maybe you're new here, Vandit. Thanks for joining us. That's awesome. Hey, thanks for joining. New guy or a new person. That's I don't know. Awesome. Super cool. Yeah. So yeah, lots of people. David's here again. Uh, Cardi Case here. Howdy. Hey. Hey. So yeah, cool. We have a lot of uh, a lot of people joining us. Rontos here. Oh, I like the logo. That's cool. I need a logo like that. That is neat. That's cool. <laughs> I'm a sucker for um. Uh, that kind of like the blue to pink thing gradient. So the, the cool. gradient I like there, it. I like it. It's cool. Super good. Um, yeah. And thanks for calling me out, Adam. Yeah. Just to, uh, thank you. Um, <laughs> it's a sweet intro. So, let's... Man. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what's going on today? we got a so today, some Microsoft if you don't thing. Know, if you're like lived under a rock, I mean, today's um, Microsoft builds going on right now. So you can watch some stuff. They've got plenty of announcements going on. I'm sure. Um, one of the big ones is Nadella, the CEO of Microsoft, said that 95% of the Fortune 500 use Azure. Wow. 95 What a stat that is. What That's a stat, a stat that stat. is. That's like, is that a beat down on AWS? Like AWS Amazon, Amazon, Amazon you, can you can deal with the 5%. <laughs> <laughs> AWS prices, we have 100. So well, maybe. Like, <laughs> I just showed the power of, um, of what Microsoft's rolling out. So, and the big announcement, I think, um, that I, that came out um, today, I believe it was today, is that um, Blazor went into production. Yeah, I have that here too, actually. Yeah. Um, here you go. You can see this. Uh, they put it out. Yeah, and it was, was it yeah. today the 19th? Yeah, 19th today. So, yeah, they must have talked about this this morning already. Yeah, so they've already talked about that, that it's in production now, which is very, very cool. Um, so they've added a lot of stuff to it. So I need to redo some of the stuff I'm working on so I can show you guys. Um, Blazor WebAssembly, specifically... Um, PWA under it, which is kind of neat. Um, progressive web apps, which is kind of cool that it runs anywhere. Um, so it's kind of neat. But um, Blazor is the new hot thing for Microsoft. It's really cool. Um, we'll see how well they roll it out, but it's in production. So now you can build production apps on it and it's supported by Microsoft. So that's kind of cool. Exciting. So Awesome. Yeah. Very neat. Do yeah. you you think it going to like production then means you're gonna have to change a bunch of your stuff? Does it did it mean that it changed? Do you oh, know? I know it's I, I don't think my current movie app works. I I, I gotta okay. like go fix it. I'm sure. <laughs> okay. I mean, like um, <laughs> it's I was doing that probably three months ago. So like uh um I need to go go look at it. I mean okay. it's compiled, so it's probably working. I'm just saying that it probably doesn't compile if I bring it up in Visual Studio at this point. Okay, right. Everything's changed. Right. So it's kind of cool. Okay, I like it. yeah. Cool. Interesting. Yeah. So they're going on all day. Um, they have us today and tomorrow. Yeah. Exactly. And it's free too. So you can go to, I think free it's like go Microsoft go or whatever. Just, yeah. Go watch some stuff. Catch and Scott's the there too. Key, yeah. yeah get a, Scott's get there. Keynote. I'm sure, I promise you it's worth the watch. I haven't yeah, seen it yet. It will be. It. Yeah. It will be. He's good. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's good at conferences. He's, he's funny. Yeah. He's a funny guy. <laughs> So we've we've got a hot show today. We've got a, a guest today. That's we do. Cool. We have an awesome guest today. Yeah, we do. Um, so um, we'll bring her on here in a second. But um, basically, we have Jen Kramer here today, and she's been doing this for almost twenty years. Um, she's a lecturer at Harvard University Extension School at the master and has a in the Masters of Liberal Arts in Digital Media Design. 
Um, she teaches at least five courses per year. So she's very busy. Um, she advises students and she assists in curriculum design as well. Um, and then she won an award in 2018, the Shat Talk Award winner present for excellence in teaching. That's awesome. And she also That's has written good. a bunch of books. So like, you know, and then we're talking a about bunch of books. Before a bunch go, of books. But, um, and one that I knew. Yeah. There was one there's a book that I knew too, the the bootstrap yeah. book. Bootstrap and I was like, oh, hours. I, I, I like that book. Part of that. So I didn't that. know that. I'm like, I like that book. <laughs> that was kind of funny. We found out that, that she wrote that book too. So like uh, let's bring Jen on the show. Let's bring Jen on. Hey Jen, hey, how are you doing? How are you doing? Doing great. Awesome. Hey, thanks for coming out. Thanks for having so, me. Um, so tell us a little bit. You're at you're at Harvard. Um, tell yeah. us what you do there and how did you get in there? <laughs> Yeah, I'm pretty amazed every day. <laughs> there. Um, yeah, so uh, I teach I teach website design and development at Harvard in our digital media program, and uh, I, it's at least five classes a year. It's usually more like seven or eight. Right. And, wow. yeah, you are busy. I am a very busy person. Yeah, and uh, how I got in, I I had a friend who was teaching there. He brought me on as a co instructor, and the next year I was like, "How about I teach my own stuff." Okay, and they cool. like that. And then I said, how about some more classes? And they like that. And so, you know, we've just kept on going. <laughs> okay. So, How are you handling COVID right now? What What's changed at, at, at your school? How are you guys handling that? Well, Harvard was actually one of the leaders. Harvard University in general was one of the leaders in sending the students home at spring break. Mm -hmm. so they, I think they announced that like March 6th or something that they were sending all the students home for spring break and then they were not going to come back. Mm -hmm. uh, but Harvard is enormous. And so uh, the extension school is the purpose of the extension school is to extend Harvard's education to those who can't attend Harvard in person. Right. And so we were already online. My classes were already 100 percent online. So for me, it wasn't a huge change. Uh, but for my colleagues, it was a big change. And of course, uh, higher ed was really upended. Those were a uh, very difficult few weeks for us. Yeah, I'm sure it was. Yeah. yeah. Suddenly, you got to do this online, and you have never done that before. Exactly, exactly. It's a huge so, change. Yeah, even finding a webcam at that time was kind of hard. So. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yes, it was. Yeah, we've it been was. down that route. Trying to find any kind of equipment to go remote is like it was stuff's hard. like gold. It's yeah, crazy. we um, at Carter Foundry, that's what we had to do. We had to convert to um, a virtual classroom immediately. Yep. Uh, here in North Carolina, and that was difficult. Yeah, um, but we're doing it now, and I think we're going to stay doing it for the foreseeable future because we don't know yep. Yep. what the state governments are really going to tell us to do as far as like, you know, yep. education coming, really coming back in person, period. Like, in other words, if they say, yes, Harvard or Cutter Foundry, you can do it at 50 percent capacity. Right. You might as well just stay virtual so you can at least get as many people in your classrooms as you can. So, yeah, right. absolutely true. Right. Yeah. And a, a lot of students didn't really like the change. And partially that's because they've got instructors who have taught years and years and years in person. Right. And their, their initial impulse is, OK, well, if I'm not standing in front of the classroom talking to all these people, I'll just get on Zoom and I'll do my same 45 minute lecture. Right. And shockingly, they find out that people don't really want to listen for 45 minutes. Yeah. While we're sitting at home and the dog's running around and the kids are doing this, that and the other thing. And, you know, whatever yeah. other craziness is going on at the same time. So uh, I think as people get more experienced with online education, appreciating where their students are and uh, uh, a better idea of how to leverage good online technique, I think people will like it better. The, yeah. the initial impulse from the students are, oh, this was terrible. It wasn't very good. Well, when people don't know what they're doing, it's probably yeah, exactly. <laughs> But now we have some experience, and I think it's going to wind up going, being better going forward. Right, yeah. yeah. So you do have I to agree. work on your mics and your lighting, and exactly. um, you can't just be monotone the whole time. You've got to engage yeah. them. You've got to build interactivity, yeah. get feedback from all these people. So exactly. are you primarily yeah. using Zoom, or what do you guys use to teach with? We have Zoom as a platform at Harvard, and yeah. uh, many of our, our students are very accustomed to using that. Uh, we, we've pioneered some techniques where uh, you actually had a live classroom where the instructor can be teaching to those who are there in that in-person classroom, plus right. a big um, Zoom connection on the walls. So there's like several cameras on the wall, and they're right. live streaming oh, cool. the class. And um, the instructor, the instructor view, you know, as you stand at the front of the room in the back and a few sides, there are these big monitors that'll show all the Zoom people who are participating. 
And uh, so, so a lot of people really like that because they feel like the Zoom people actually feel like they're in the classroom and, and right. being part of it. So that's, okay. that's, that's something we've been pioneering for a while. But, but me personally, I teach online, holy, holy, asynchronous, online, no Zoom. Uh, so you can take my classes from anywhere in the world and, uh, and participate whatever time zone you happen to be in. Okay. That's awesome. So this was a much easier transition for you personally then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but even even I had to make changes to my classes because my students were different. Okay. Right. right. My students are adults. Okay. So they're not the 18 to 22 year olds. They are adults. They have jobs. They have lives. They have families. They have all kinds of craziness going on around them all the time. And they put school on top of all of that. I mean, I right. just have tremendous respect for them. And so to suddenly find themselves working at home with uh, some kind of partner or spouse and children running around trying to be homeschooled at the same time and the dog yeah. over there eating out of the garbage can <laughs> and, and you know all the other things that were going on. Yeah. We needed to rework classes as well, even though we were wholly online, just because people, uh, it just takes time to make that transition. It does. Yeah. yeah like, cool. Definitely. We have a question from MSV. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to paraphrase this a little bit, but how did you start programming? What got you into into this what's your origin story that's how i like yeah. to say you know, how did you get here so. <laughs> well i'm i'm very old so i i actually started but um i was in college before there was a web <laughs> right <laughs> <laughs> so sad anyway uh uh what happened was i i majored in biology so i actually worked in science for a period of time uh, i worked in the lab i did experiments uh and eventually gravitated towards science marketing and you may or may not know this, but scientists were the ones who, that pioneered the web. It was a physicist who wanted to share his research papers with those behind the Iron Curtain back when that was a thing. So back in Soviet days, how do we right. share our scientific data? And that's what the web was originally designed to do, or, or one of the things that it did. Uh, so the scientists were always ahead of the curve. So I wound up like always trying to figure out how to update the website back in the day when there was only HTML. That was it. And we worked in a little code editor, like Notepad. That was what we had. <laughs> mm -hmm. But it was so much fun that that uh, in the year 2000, early in 2000, I said, this is awesome. I am going to go back to graduate school. I'm going to get a degree. I'm going to go do this. By that point in time, the stock market was like way sky high. We were right in the tech bubble. It was going to go on forever. We were all going to make tons of money. So as soon as I quit my job, like six weeks later, the bottom fell out of the stock market. Mm -hmm. I enrolled in grad school in the September of 2000, graduated in August of 2001, had my first real client meeting on September 10th, 2001. Okay. Better and better. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and then, of course, the whole world changed at that moment in time. And uh, somehow I freelanced my way through it and survived. Um, okay. So, yeah, that's how I got started. I decided to go back to school. Uh, and at that point in time, uh, there just happened to be a master's degree in my town of Brattleboro, Vermont, Marlboro College. And uh, we not only learned coding, like at that point, it was literally HTML. There was no CSS. <laughs> we right. didn't learn any of the other programming stuff. Uh, but we also learned a lot about marketing. We learned about strategy, project management, and everything else. We were kind of like translators. So we translated between... Uh, the, the people who were thinking about marketing in the historic sense of the word, I guess at this point in time, print marketing, TV, radio, they were just trying to figure out the internet. And then the programmers who could actually program something, but had no idea how to talk to the marketing people. We were the people that kind of went in between. Okay. Interesting. Do you remember who your first client was? What was the first thing you built? You remember? It was a website for a house. And okay. Yep. Uh, so I was living, like I said, in Brattleboro, Vermont, and the median income at that point in time was about $40,000. This house was worth $1.875 million. And the guy had six bedrooms, six bathrooms. It had 11 skylights. It had a pool, a bocce ball court. It had a home gym. It had an in-law apartment, all this stuff. And the guy wanted to sell it, but real estate wasn't online. There was no, no online real estate. Right. So, Zillow, this is pre-realtor.com, yeah, exactly. pre-Zillow. Yeah. In those days, if you wanted to buy something, you would actually walk into a realtor's office and there was like a three-ring binder sitting on a table and you would like flip through the listings. 
<laughs> with the actual paper photos in them. Okay. So right. he, he had this radical idea that he wanted to reach people in New York City and Boston, like rich people who had money who might want to buy a big house like this. And so he hired me to do this. Uh, we, we talked out oh, fr that first day, September 10th, we talked about getting a helicopter. We're going to have him come in oh. with the foliage and take all the pictures of the leaves. It was going to be great. And of course, after September 11th, the helicopters were grounded for three days or sorry, three right. weeks, three weeks right. they were grounded. So yeah, that was, it was quite a time. <laughs> That's crazy. And, and I would have built that website in Dreamweaver. Okay, Dreamweaver, cool. the tool of choice of the time, right? What? <laughs> what? I remember Dreamweaver. based layouts. <laughs> so, so Dreamweaver, was Dreamweaver like a, a, was that a WYSIWYG editor, if I remember rightly? Is that, uh, yeah, or was it not? There was front page and Dreamweaver and okay, you know, all that kind I remember of the good old days there. like that. Yeah, yeah. we drag and drop and, and make some yeah. pretty awful HTML, but you know it worked. We did. Yeah, we did. So. Uh, we used to do rollover images. That was the main purpose for JavaScript, yeah. <laughs> and that was one of the big reasons for owning Dreamweaver because that would give you the the toggle between the two states of the image and give you that rollover effect. Uh, because we didn't have CSS, we didn't have a hover state. Right. Right, so it's, it's come a long way. I mean, like you think about like what, what it's definitely come a long doing, way. So. Yeah, it really has. Yeah. So what 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 can you show us today? What what can you show us today? What do you want to show us today? Yeah. So we had been talking about the world of flexbox and okay. uh, and and web page layouts. And uh, just today, I was reading an article uh, by by a PhD student at the University of Indiana. And she did a study realizing that websites are looking more and more and more alike today than they have at any other point in time, which is pretty amazing when you think about it. Yeah. Uh, and so why has that happened and when did it happen? Well, they looked most different between like 2008 and 2010. And currently they look most similar. So what, what's gone on in that time since 2010 to now? A bunch of things. We have a bunch of trends that happened in the web. First of all, of course, was the whole launch of mobile platforms, tablets, uh, that kind of thing. The uh, requirement of changing screen sizes and responsive mm -hmm. design, all that happened. Uh, the rise of JavaScript. I mean, JavaScript was historically a toy, right? And right. now it's like this thing that people are seriously, seriously using on the front end and the back end. The back oh, end yeah. is new, right? Mm -hmm. So we have that whole thing that happened. And then of course we had Bootstrap, which was released around 2011. And right. so what's what the trend that I see in education is that we put more and more emphasis on JavaScript. We put more emphasis on backend programming, less and less and less on HTML and CSS. It's like, this is HTML like one day. And then like, here's CSS for two days. And then off we are, go to the races to uh, real programming. Right, exactly. And, and I think it definitely leads to um, declined creativity on the web, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the reason that people use Bootstrap is because they don't understand how web, web layouts work. And I'm here to show you that it's really, really very easy. And it only, there's only a couple of things that you need to know and you will be a Flexbox layout master. Okay, cool. Awesome. <laughs> you're, saying I can, you, you're saying I can like horizontally position a div, center a div horizontally? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Make my footer stick on the bottom. So. Do whatever you want, okay? <laughs> awesome. So we have one question here. Um, sure. This is this is for uh, for us, Jen. Yeah. So we're older than um, we're older than Kevin. So like, uh, only just you're <laughs> that much older. Than me. <laughs> I'm just youthful faced. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So what's um, the yeah, so the ahead, question is, yeah, was it difficult to program something without Google, GitHub, and Stack Overflow? Well, we had Alta Vista. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I remember we, we bought books back then, Jen. Yeah, That's we what did. we did. Yeah. <laughs> we bought a I lot of books, and they were paper books. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, there was no Kindle versions back then. Right. So we bought a lot of books. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, how did you know which book to buy when you couldn't Google which book to buy? That's really? the Barnes and Noble and bought them all. Shot in the dark. That's, <laughs> that's why Amazon was so amazing because you right. had access to all of those different kinds of books. Yeah. Um, no, GitHub. GitHub's relatively recent, isn't it? It's like, it uh, like yeah. the last ten years or so. Yeah. Yeah. Somewhere relatively there. recent. I would yeah. say in terms of 
of our of our life and programming. It's definitely recent. Right, right, yep. right. Yeah. yeah, we built the web pretty well before we had GitHub. So right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Well, show us some CSS. Let's get going on Flexbox here. I think that'd be kind of cool. All right. So yeah. So I think I think we have a link, Kevin. We can post it again in case it's getting buried here. We got a lot of a lot of people coming out in questions. So um, yeah. Let me. Um, and you can follow along with in, your yeah. CodePen. Is that correct? Yes, it is okay. CodePen, and uh, I've given you guys the URL there. Okay. So you guys uh, all set here? Or are you Are you taking a look at what's going on? Uh, we are right now. There we are. All right. Comment cool. in um, chat down here so these guys can go there too. Okay. Fabulous. So a couple of things just to set yeah. up. They can follow this in CodePen or they can fork it themselves. Is that correct? Exactly. So if you go to the link that's there in the chat, you can come right here and you can code along with me. If you want to code along with me right here in this window, that's going to work great. Or uh, there, th if you create an account, there is a fork button down here in the lower right hand corner right there uh, where you can fork this and then you can save it to your account and look at it later. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and fork this now so I don't start writing code over top of everything else. There we go. All right. So you guys ready there? We are ready. I'm ready. I'm We're ready right now. So I got okay. to <laughs> so, so some of you may have uh, a view where you've got the boxes going across the screen, HTML, CSS, JavaScript going across the top. I find it easier to work in this view where they're side by side like this. Uh, so if you hit the change view button, there's some buttons down here on the bottom. You can just go on ahead and choose one of those. So mine, my code's over here on the left. That's how I've got mine set up. Okay. So Let's say that you have a web page and you've started this far, okay? The very first thing to do anytime you start coding your web page is to work on the HTML. And you want to make sure that the HTML markup is as semantic as possible. You want to communicate meaning through your code. In other words, don't put in 75 layers of divs. That's a fashion no, people. Mm. And put in things like, these are little articles. This is syndicatable content. We're talking about apples and how fabulous apples are. And we have a little picture of apples and we have a link to read more about apples, right? That's kind of a little article all by itself. So I've marked that up as such over here in my HTML. So you see here, I've got four articles all next to each other. Isn't that lovely? Oh, awesome. and then, yeah. And then down here underneath, uh, I've got some CSS going on. This is nothing you're going to need to change. This is just uh, what is required in order to make that page look pretty. We're going to add the Flexbox part to this. Okay. okay. So the first thing I'd like you to do is I want you to realize the biggest secret to Flexbox is managing parents and children. That's all there is to it. There's nothing more difficult than managing parents and children. And we have fancy names for these in Flexbox. They're called Flex Containers and Flex Items. A Flex Container is the parent. A Flex Item is the child. So your first job is to identify where are the parents and where are the children. Okay? So if I want these four things, these are four articles, and I'd like them to show up all in one big row on the page. What are they? Are they a parent or are they a child? Probably a child, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So uh, here in your HTML code, what I'm going to do right next to the line number there, there's a little arrow. If you click that, this will just collapse these guys and give you a real easy view here. See how we've just got four articles there? Those are four lonely children. They're orphans. They've got no parents. Okay. So the first thing we need to do is put in place a parent. And I'm going to use a div tag here. And the reason I'm going to use a div tag is because it's not going to do anything except hold a class for me. And that class is going to have the creative name of row because this is going to be a row. All right. And then down here, we can go ahead and close that div. All right. And we can indent those to keep it looking pretty. So far, so good, right? Now we have a parent. Our parent is the div with the class of row, and we have four children. They're each an article. So far, so good. So now what we're going to do is we're going to go to our CSS, and here inside of our CSS, return a whole bunch of times so we have some space. 
The first thing I'm going to do here right at the very top of my CSS is I'm going to set up my class of row. And then I'm going to set up three properties. And these three properties, you can set these three properties up every single time. And you can set them up in exactly the same way because this is the way it's always going to be when you lay out a bunch of boxes in a row in Flexbox. This is how you do it. So first of all, display flex. You probably knew that part, right? And we're done. Any questions? <laughs> That's awesome. It already did something. That's cool. Yeah, it did. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So then the next thing to do is going to be to uh, go on ahead and say the flex flow property. This is technically not required, but I like to put it in for documentation reasons. This is actually the default behavior in Flexbox. We're going to put things into a row and we're going to wrap them onto another row um, as we go on to the next elements on the page. And then we're going to add justify hyphen content. And we're going to say space between. All right, so justify content is a property that talks about how we're going to deal with extra space as we're laying out this web page. And so how, how are we going to deal with that? Are we going to shove everything to one side or the other side of the row and just leave the extra space as a whole big thing? Or are we going to break that space up in some way between those boxes? I like space between because it shoves the outside boxes all the way to the outside. So all the way to the left, all the way to the right. It'll take whatever space is left over and put it evenly between each box. Does that be, is that responsive too? Then that's if it's wide, it does that. If it's it narrow, it does that. Kind of responsive, kind okay. of sort of. I think designers would be unhappy, but you know, it it'll it will respond to um, your okay. browser widths, and we'll take a look okay. at that in a little bit more detail as soon as we finish writing this code. So, uh, any other questions at this point? I don't no, think so. No. I think we're good. Fabulous. Okay. So then the only other thing that you're going to need is this. We're going to set up, I'm going to use my generic article because I have a very simple document. Article is the only one that's there. So might as well use it. And the property that's going to go here is called flex hyphen basis. If you're not familiar with this property, you might've been thinking it's going to be width, right? Because we need to set how wide these boxes are. Right now, if I just go on ahead and drop a border on this, one pixel solid tomato. Okay, I drop a border on that. You see that these boxes right now are as wide as their containing element, right? And uh, so right now they're basically 100% wide, all right? But if I change my flex basis to another number, like 20%, that's going to go ahead and drop everything right here on a row real fast and simple and easy. And the reason I'm going to use flex basis is because flex basis is what puts the flex in flex box. <laughs> okay. Okay. Width is actually a very absolute unit of measure. If I said my width was 20%, it would never be 19.9%. It would never be 20.1%. It would always be 20.00000 percent even though percent is considered a relative unit of measure. When I go to flex basis, this actually says, make it 20%, kind of as close as you can get. If you have to muck around with things a little bit, that's okay. So if we go a little bit bigger, a little bit smaller, then that's totally fine. Okay. So that's what flex basis is going to do. You may have seen this written before as flex, something like three numbers like this. That's the shorthand, okay? The first number there is flex grow, the second number is flex shrink, and the third number is the flex basis. Uh, the grow and the shrink are di dictate how big or how, how, uh, how big or small one of those boxes is going to get relative to the others there in the row. Not really relevant to our layout. All we need to worry about is the flex basis, so that's the reason why I use that. Okay. okay? How are you guys doing so far? Any questions? Mine looks awesome. just like yours, so that's good. good. <laughs> Everyone says it's good. It says yeah. uh, Yusef said it's good. Ronto says that's cool. And Tech with Esfan says it was magical. So Sweet. <laughs> okay. You're magic today, Jen. Fabulous. <laughs> you guys ready to go on? Because this this is the heart of the whole matter, but we can okay. always make it, we can always add a little bit more, make it okay, just cool. a bit more complicated. 
You ready? Yeah, yeah. let's go. All right. So uh, let's go ahead and put a little uh, padding on this. I'm going to put on one rim. I like rims. Uh, the reason why is the root relative M. If you haven't heard of rem as a unit before, I'd be happy to discuss that separately and show you how those work. Uh, but it's based, it's basically one rem is about 16 pixels. Okay. Right. And it's based on the size of the text. It's going to be responsive in that as your text size gets bigger, so will the space around things. So it gets stays proportional. That's part of the reason I like it. Yeah, okay. I, I, and Jen, is this correct in saying that we should probably use rims wherever we can and not use pixels? Uh, yes, you should definitely stay away from pixels where you can. Right. That would be a good thing to do. All right, cool. Okay, so uh, now if you do the math here, I have four boxes, right? Shouldn't those four boxes add up to 100% here going across this row? Wouldn't you say? Yeah. 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 Right. So right now I've got 20%. So let's, what happens if I go to 25%? It wrapped around. It's going to wrap around. Why is it wrapping around? Because, well, you got a space in there. But do I have a space in there? I, I haven't called for a space anywhere except on my pattern, right? Right. Yes, on your pattern. Or, the space actually comes from the fact that that fourth box wrapped onto the next line. That's where that space is coming from there. Okay. So it's using space between for those three. Yeah. See, I can okay. make this smaller. We can smoosh it down about there. Whoops. And then we're going to wrap again. Right? So we could get rid of all that space in between there. Yeah. All right. So here's what's going on. This is a CSS thing that I think makes a lot of people really frustrated because they don't understand this part of it. And this is has to do with the box model. Everybody knows what the box model is, right? Yeah. What, what does box model say? I don't know what it says. Tell me what, I don't it, know says. what it says. Okay. That's a good place to start. So box model says that every HTML element has got three elements associated with it, three properties. Uh, one is going to be the padding which is the space between the border and the content, right? So this is the padding right in here. Mm -hmm. The border itself, okay? And then outside of that is the margin, right? Right. That's what the box model says. By default, you work with what's called the content box model. The content box model says when you put in that property called width or you put in that property called flex basis, what is it actually measuring? You may know. The viewport? Is that what it's measuring? Or? No, those properties are actually measuring the content, just okay. the content from end to end. Okay. So when I say my flex basis is 25%, the actual width of that row is not 100%. It's 100% plus all of that additional padding that I put in and mm -hmm. all of those additional borders. So in other words, more than 100%. And it's a weird conversion now because I have to deal with rems and percents and pixels and all kinds of craziness, right? Right, right. Okay. Fortunately, this is a problem that can be fixed. And the way you do that is you change your box model to what's called the border box model. And what the border box model says is that width property or that flex basis property will actually include the width of the border, the width of the padding, and the width of the content inside all together. That's now covered by width or by flex basis. Okay. So now the math should work, right? 25% times four should add up to 100. We should get everything on one row. Make sense? Right. Yep. All right. So let's go on ahead and show you how to do that then. At the very top of your document, this should be the very first thing you put in. By the way, you may want to do this forever after for every web page <laughs> you ever work on from now until the end of time, okay? Because it'll just make your life easier. We'll go ahead and put in HTML because that's our root level element, right? When we're working with HTML and CSS, we don't get more root than the HTML tag. And we're going to say that our box hyphen sizing is border box. By default, it's called content box, content hyphen box. Okay. Okay. So nothing changed. Why is that? Because in all their wisdom, the great programmers who put this together said, that is not an inheritable property. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You would think you'd want it inherited. So we need another line of code that's going to tell us to inherit it. So 
everything in the universe, that's the star, and everything that comes before it, and everything that comes after it, we want the box sizing to inherit. Wow. Cool. Okay. Huh? That's cool. I have never seen that before. That's super cool. <laughs> yeah. Pretty nice, huh? And it will actually solve a lot of your layout problems just by these two lines of code right there. A lot of people think that the box model works differently than it does by default in CSS. And they have a lot of trouble calculating the total width of a row and that kind of thing. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. they don't understand why it didn't add to 100%. It just makes no sense. Part of it is because you don't understand how the box model works. Putting these lines of code in there at the top will make it work the way you think it will. So now what's going to happen is uh, flex spaces here. I haven't specified uh, any, any em empty space. So 25 times 4 is 100%. If I wanted uh, to put in some space in between those, I can make my flex spaces slightly smaller, you know, 24%, right? Put a little space in between them. Uh, if I was working with margin, I can work with margin, margin plus width, margin plus flex spaces. And, and if you work in percents in all of those, then you wind up with very, very easy layouts. Make sense? That's super good. Here you go. Glenn has a question about this. Yeah. Why wouldn't the box model default be border box? Oh, I what know. Is the, what is the reason for the other way? Is there a reason? Do you Wouldn't know? Great. No, history. History <laughs> just, like all Just the because? <laughs> yeah, because that's the content box model was the way things were done at the beginning of CSS, at the beginning of time. And the border box model is a relatively recent addition to the CSS library. Uh, and of course, people love it. Once they know about it, they, they just love everything about it. Uh, but it is not considered the default by the W3C or whoever puts it in place. And the, the browser manufacturers haven't made it the default model. So you right. just have to declare it. And you declare That's it the same way every time. Just take those little code lines of code and just drop it in your initial CSS document for everything you ever write from now until the end of time. That's <laughs> awesome. That's super good. Well, Talal definitely said he's had that problem forever. So we thank you very much. You're welcome. <laughs> Um, and tech, tech with Estevan said that's really cool. He's never used that thing, but uh, thanks for the tip. Sure, sure. So, yeah, you, it's, it's awesome. Actual programmer just says awesome. Yay. <laughs> that's, All that's right. amazing. I can keep going here. I can show you how to make this um, fully responsive if you like at this point, or I'm not sure what your timing is like here. We still got yeah. plenty of time. Let's do it. Keep going. Let's, Let's do, do it. it. Yeah. All right. All right. So, we have fake responsiveness going on here. Yeah. So if I just kind of make this narrower. Yeah. Things sort of wrap onto another line eventually. Trust me, your designer friends are really unhappy about this. <laughs> See how those boxes don't quite line up and you know, it yeah. doesn't look as beautiful. So we need to add some responsiveness here that'll make this look beautiful and your designer friends will be much happier people. And so the, this becomes really easy now. Uh, because all we need to do is think about what is going to change. What changes as we go to different breakpoints with our media queries, right? I'm assuming you actually have a little bit of background on making things responsive. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what's gonna change as the screen size gets, um, right now we're working at desktop dimensions, so we have a very large screen size with four boxes going across this way. But usually we work with something called mobile first, right? right. And mobile first says what? I want to design first for mobile. First, so to the want, right. I want, it, I want it to stack the way I want it to look on mobile first. Exactly. And then we're yeah. going to make it bigger from there, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So what we're going to need to do then is determine of the code that we've written so far, what needs to be outside the media query. In other words, the default mobile layout. What would that be? And the truth of the matter is pretty much all of it. Yeah. Okay. Except the flex basis is not going to be 24%. It's going to be a hundred percent. Okay. Right. It's going to stack okay. like this on a phone. Yep. All right. So now all we have to do is write our media query and you know, I'm just going to pick some media query breakpoints here. Your, your mileage may vary by quite a bit. <laughs> so um, min width, 
And, and since this is mobile first, we are definitely going to work with this with min widths and just stack those on top of each other. The styles will cascade from one uh, media query to the next one. So what was valid here outside the media query, if it's um, not overridden inside the media query, it continues to be useful. That's a really great thing. So our media, let's say 600 pixels. And so here, maybe I'd like to have two boxes and two boxes for kind of a tablet size device, right? Two and two. Yep. Okay. Yep. So all I need to do here is say if my article is going to change what? What property? I would assume flex basis. Flex basis. 50%. Sweet. That's all there is to it. Yay. Okay. So can anyone guess what comes next? Another media query? <laughs> Could be, yeah. <laughs> so now we'll write this for, let's say, min width 900 pixels. And once again, our article. And the flex basis would be 25%. Right. And it's not changing here because my screen isn't big enough. There we go. Yep. There you go. Nice, huh? Awesome. Sweet. Yeah, that's how's, very cool. How's it feeling? <laughs> I think these guys think are doing awesome. good. So, like, um, um, a lot of times you're overriding um, media queries. A lot of times I'm writing them because I'm using Bootstrap and I'm like changing them. Right, exactly. So, maybe I need to quit using Bootstrap. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, let's see here. I do have a question. Victor's asking, this is probably a, a generic question. I don't know if you know the answer to this, but what sizing for the media queries do you think are good standards? Are there standards for these? No. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. There are no standards. <laughs> we live in a world where we have phone sized tablets and, you know. <laughs> <laughs> then, are, but tablets and I don't know. And it, it's crazy. We live in crazy land. So no, it depends on your design. And the right. best way to do this is really to take a look at your design and kind of go, you sort of start scrunching things together and go, oh, that looks good. Oh, that's starting to look a little tight there. That's better. Oh, that's starting to look a little tight there. That's better. I mean, that's really all there is to it. And you can, you can do this even if you have no designer sensibilities, when you get down to, just a few words per line, it starts to get a little annoying to read, doesn't it? It gets mm -hmm. really long. And that's a point to put in a media query. You can do this. Right. And yeah. I think Bootstrap has some media queries. They 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 document theirs. They do. What they're what they think is like also oh, they've decided on some standards. Yeah. And so the problem okay. is, is when you she's Jen's right though, if you're using Bootstrap and then you build something. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you have to override those because it doesn't work always like you want it to because your design is different. Yeah. And in, in a perfect world, when you build with Bootstrap, what you're going to do is you're going to dig into the SAS and mm -hmm. you'll change those breakpoints right inside of the SAS and then recompile the SAS right. uh, so that you'll have breakpoints that actually work with your design. That would be the way to do it with Bootstrap. Right. Kind of cool. Awesome. We have a question from Troy Mitchell. Thanks for the question, Troy. Um, Says it's awesome. Uh, what's your rule of thumb when choosing flex or flexbox or grid? Yeah. Oh, great stuff. Yeah, we didn't even had a chance to talk about grid, <laughs> but uh, the truth of the matter is, flexbox. What I'm showing you here is an industry standard at the moment, but it, truthfully, it's a hack. <laughs> flexbox, okay. Flexbox is want to be flexible and free. <laughs> okay. Right. <laughs> so, really, flexbox is was originally envisioned as the tool where you have, let's say some number of images coming in off a server that you need to display in some kind of nice looking grid uh, on a web page, just as a, as a use case, right? You don't know how many images you've got coming in, but you need four, four going across each of the page and some number going down the page. Flexbox is really, really good at that kind of thing. So in other words, you can think of that as one dimensional. We've got a whole bunch of stuff, it's one row, it's gonna wrap around forever until it fills the screen, okay? Grid is designed to be two dimensional. So in other words, you can specify your layout, not only in rows, the way we do with Flexbox, one row and then another row and then another row, but we can actually 
uh, specify what our vertical layout is going to be as well. And okay. one, one of the uh, exercises that I've done in my, my friend and master's course is I take some paintings from Piet Mondrian, and you've seen these before. It's like the side of the Partridge family bus or <laughs> dresses okay. that are based on this. It's those colors, those squares with the white, yellow, blue, and red uh, yep. and different patterns. Yep. You can only achieve that kind of pattern with something like grid. So I, so I use that as an example to show like the crazy layouts you can make with grid that are just not really possible when it comes to Flexbox. Right, okay. Yeah. Would you ever use a combination of both? Sure, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. That would okay. be recommended. You, so you would use grid, say, to frame the whole outside of the website, header, nav bar, sidebars, that kind of thing. And then Flexbox could be the flexible layout that you have in the in the main content area. Uh, okay. Whatever it is you have coming off the server, for example. Okay, Ooh. awesome. <laughs> Glenn says, when you have Jen, who needs bootstrap? <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. There you Come go. And you save and, it and, and, you. <laughs> Exactly. And Yusef says, you saved me months. So that's oh, awesome. Yay. <laughs> that's yeah. awesome. That's yeah. super good. Um, here's a good question for you. Um, what do you think are CSS trends for 2020 in the future? Mm. Oh, Have yeah. Have any idea about trends? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do I need to keep this code up? I can come back to the. Uh, no, we can. Uh, we can come back yeah, to we this. Can, we can do that. Yeah. Okay, there so you go. I'll go ahead and stop sharing. Then I can actually see you guys. There we oh, go. Right. <laughs> it, does, it does get small sometimes. <laughs> nice. Uh, big trends. Well, you know, um, there are trends that worry me, and there's trends that make me really happy. So I really mm. love these new layout tools in CSS. After you know. 15 years that we had of living in the wilderness of let's try to make floats work and, and positioning oh, floats. And tables. <laughs> all the hacks that we've used through the years for layouts. Uh, it's really great to finally have some wonderful tools that are designed to do layouts. And those are just going to continue to expand and grow and get adopted. Uh, the trends that worry me are trends where people are doing increasingly embedding uh, HTML and CSS inside of their JavaScript. Yeah. I hate that. One, two, yeah, two. There's a big trend to try to break inheritance, break the cascade, um, and just modularize and compartmentalize JavaScript to the point of I'll just grab this thing and it, all the HTML and CSS and JavaScript comes with it and I just copy and paste. And while that's like really convenient, you actually break a lot of the stuff that I just showed you there and how neatly things inherit in the CSS, all of that um, goes away. Right. A. And B, people who don't necessarily have uh, the, the in-depth JavaScript experience that other people do, but may have experience in, say, uh, graphic design or really new CSS in depth, can't participate in those kinds of development environments. You're actually excluding all of them because everything is inside of the JavaScript. Right, right. So you're condemning cool. JavaScript developers who really want to do JavaScript. Now they're going to have to learn HTML and CSS as well. Right. I think I think you violate what I call separations of concerns. Um, so when you work on a larger project, you yep. want the designer to be able to do the design part. Exactly. And you want to do the coding part. And That's the right. first moment that you're building HTML with a string, yeah, you're just like killing it. You're like you know, like, and so like I, I mean, I've worked on projects where they have spent enormous amounts of money making the design look great, and it does. And then there's these like pockets of crap that happens yeah. you're like why does it look that way why is that button suddenly blue because they have a style <laughs> in some javascript file somewhere that you got to go go find and change you know and it's just you know it's just we need to quit doing that uh-huh yeah yeah we you're you're old enough to remember bobby we thought we fought a huge battle on this back in right. the early 2000s with the web standards project my whole shag and eric meyer and jeffrey yeah. zeltman and we fought to get separation of concerns. We fought to get the browsers treating their code the same way and not having different document object models for Netscape right. and Internet Explorer. Maybe you remember those things. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, we, we've come a long way since then. And now we're going to go back and mush it all together again. That just doesn't make any sense. Yeah. So like w one of the things I'm going to do next week, Kevin, is just talk about templating inside um, where you can still mark up your documents using a template tag and you can still like use it. But 
you could hand it to the designer, let the designer say, all right, I need a, I need a table that has this in it and this is what I need. And they can mark it up in HTML like you should. And then you just pull that in that way the the design can change. Exactly. And it's not like a a string of JavaScript stuff that's going on. Right. That's confusing to somebody like me. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) So it's more, it's more like building components, but the components need to be written in HTML and not like, strung together in a string so, oh yeah absolutely yeah absolutely. so cool yeah, so uh, school tech with cool, esteban is asking um he's been using css pure css for a bit now would you recommend learning a css preprocessor sas less css etc oh, great, great question and it actually brings to the other exciting thing that's happening in css right now so yes absolutely sas SAS seems to be the industry standard. That's the one that I would be um, concentrating on. Less, uh, <laughs> I, uh, Mark Otto is the guy who created Bootstrap, and he and I had a conversation at a conference, I don't know, four or five years ago now. And he, he said to me at the time, this was in Bootstrap three days, he said to me at the time, you know, if we didn't use less in our project for Bootstrap, I don't think it would even be a thing anymore. <laughs> Right. Yeah. <laughs> and I think he's right on that. So I think less is pretty much dead. I think SAS is where it's at. Uh, and there are things that SAS does that, that are really terrific. Uh, a lot of the programmers really love nesting inside of SAS just to make code easier to read. The file management you can do with SAS is just phenomenal. It just makes uh, being able to manage instead of one giant going on forever CSS file, you can have a whole bunch right. of special files and really organize your CSS. Those kinds of features are really nice. And of course, then mix-ins and extends. This brings to mind the other part that's really exciting going on in CSS right now, which is variables, also called custom properties, and uh, and, and uh, calc. And SAS has variables, and it has the ability to do math. So what's the difference between the two? Well, SAS are kind of more, they function more like global variables in that you set them once and it it is that way forever. So they're great for things like code or color. So Mm -hmm. I I want this color forever. I want this font stack forever. But when you have something like what I just showed you here with the flex basis, everything's gonna stay the same, but the flex basis is gonna change across media queries. That's something you can code using uh, uh, custom properties, CSS variables. And you just change the value of the variable across the media queries rather than having to redeclare CSS over and over again. So your code in your media queries shrinks down to almost nothing. All you have to do if you write it correctly is just change the value of a few variables. And I go through that in detail in my front end master's course on advanced CSS layouts. And I'll walk you through the whole thing, exactly how that magic happens. I give you the magic formula, the only formula you'll ever need to lay out any page, anywhere, anytime. And all you'll ever have to do is change the value of those variables across media queries, make some really efficient codes, good stuff. Okay, That's cool. very cool. Yeah. That is very cool. Here's a question from MSV. Uh, mistakes that beginners make. Yeah. Where should you concentrate as a beginner? The mistakes I've seen beginners make start with A, file management. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> file management mistakes, right? So making sure that your paths to your files are correct and uh, making sure you know the difference between a file and a folder. That kind of stuff is things that confuse, believe it or not, now in 2020, more than they did back in 2000. Back in 2000, the, bar- the technological barrier to entry to a computer was much higher and people had a sense of what files and folders were for. But if right. you think about it now, everybody's all on phones and tablets. There's still files and folders, but where are they? Yeah, they're kind of hidden, abstracted. Yeah, from you. You yeah they are. Know. They are abstracted from, yeah, definitely. Yeah. You don't have Windows Explorer on your phone. So. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. So you may, you may need to spend some time learning about files and folders if you're coming from that mobile or tablet world. Uh, then the other things are simple syntax kind of mistakes, especially in your HTML and your CSS. You can always go to one of the validators at the W3C. There's an HTML validator or a CSS validator. If you Google for them, you'll find them. And drop your code in and let them tell you that it's invalid. They'll tell you exactly where the errors are. So if you're writing valid HTML and valid CSS, it's also syntactically correct. Right. So that'll fix a lot of those, like, missing the curly bracket, forgot to close the tag, misnested tags, that kind of thing. (laughs) It's mistakes that I make a lot. And I think MSV, one of the ones, this is my personal one, is like, don't use pixels. Like, just use rims. 
That's just my, I've said it already this morning, but like um, once you do that, it makes it so much more responsive and you don't have like these random widths that are on your phone. That's like, dude, that's really wide. That's like 12 pixels, you know, that's super wide on a phone, you know, and then it's really skinny on um, like a big monitor when you wanted yeah. to you'd use more space. So like just use rims. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, so those would be the big ones, file management and syntax. Those are the problems that I usually see problem, uh, people making a lot of those mistakes. By the way, some of those problems never go away, but you'll get really good at finding them. <laughs> you <laughs> yeah. make those mistakes all the time. You'll forget. <laughs> so this is a question here. Read this one, Kevin. I think we should address this one a little bit. Okay. Alfredo, some speed, people right? say... Uh, separating HTML, CSS, and JavaScript is a separation of technologies, not a separation of concerns. Yep. Sure. When you're, yeah, I agree. But when your JavaScript goes into business logic, you're essentially doing backend coding. And so, like, if that business logic is part of you rendering the template, you can have templating. But if you're if you're writing HTML, and JavaScript, I think you're doing it wrong. And I know that a million people do it every single day. I get it. But yep. you need to like look at like what am I doing. Because then you may want to hire someone like Jen. Hey, can you make my site look good? And you, and like sixty <laughs> percent of it's in JavaScript, and it's just hard to do, especially yep. when you're like doing like inline tags and like style sheets, and like it's just hard. So I would say separate them out. You know, yep. use a templating engine of some sort. That's a, that's my advice. Yeah. Yep. Here's cool. a question. Yeah. Difference between EM and REM. Okay. <laughs> Well, I can show you my my uh, semi world famous um, demo of that. Let me. Uh, oh, let's awesome! Do some world famous <laughs> stuff. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> world famous. I like that you have something specifically for this. Like uh, everyone asks this, so like. So let me let me uh, share my screen again here. And that's an. You, this is pronounced. It's an M and a rem. M right? and rem. M and rem. Okay. Yeah, yeah. M and rem. At least that's the way I've heard them pronounced. <laughs> right. Okay, so I'm just in a blank code pen here, and I'm going to okay. put in an H1, my fine text, okay, and I'm going to put in a paragraph. Same text, my fine text, okay? Okay. So clearly, of course, by default, these are going to appear to be different sizes. What I'm going to do down here is I'm going to say H1 is going to be a font size of 1M. Ooh, and we're going to say my paragraph is going to be a font size of 1M. OK, so from the start, it looks like exactly the same font sizes that we have going on here, right? Because that's what I've done. I They're relative to the uh, root level HTML tags. So they appear to be the same font sizes here. But let me put in a background color of green and a background color of blue, possibly yellow. <laughs> yellow. And let me take out those font sizes. We'll go back to the defaults that the browser gives us, okay? Okay. And what I'm going to say now is on this H1, let's say that I want to put on padding of 1M, okay? So it's going to give me a little bit of space around between that tack, the text and the uh, edge of that. I'm going to do the same here on the paragraph. And when I put in padding of 1M on the paragraph, Take a survey. How many of you say that the words my fine text are going to align perfectly on their left edge? And how many of you say that they're not? Padding 1M. Look at that. They don't actually align. Why is that? The reason is because this is when you put padding in 1M inside of these kinds of elements. They're looking at that element. 1M is defined as the width of a lowercase little letter M at that moment in time. So in other words, this is here. That is 1M here on the H1, mm -hmm. as opposed to here on the paragraph. 
that's the width of a 1M here on my paragraph, right. okay? But right. when I go to rem, now I'm looking at a root level M. In other words, go to the HTML tag and get what 1M is defined as there. And now see how things line up? Because we're not taking it from the, the moment of, that we're looking at it here. We're going back to the root level. And so it's consistent sizing the whole way through your document. Okay. Cool. That's awesome. Some of these guys got this too. Yardley says they will not. Yeah. Uh, and Carter yeah. Case says not too. So that's awesome. And, nice. and see, when you're using that for gutters, it uh -huh. just get maddening when you're doing it. It's like, what is this thing doing? Like, they're supposed to be the same and they're not. So, like, you know, or, or you're like a spacing around some cards. I did a thing on cards. So anyway. Yeah. That's my yeah. Thing. So, so there we go. That's the purpose of that. So that's the difference between a rem and an M. Okay. That's awesome. I love yeah. it. Let's yeah. wrap up with one final question here then. Get Derek um, in here. Derek's is hard. I don't know if we can yeah. answer this one, but. Uh, okay. Derek says he's currently working on, Derek's a former Coder Foundry student too. Yeah. Um, so he's currently working on a project that requires heavy print styling rules. Any suggestions to make the print styles easier besides just a lot of media queries? That's what it says. That's what a media <laughs> query is. <laughs> <laughs> so no, Derek, you stuck with it. Sorry. You... <laughs> media queries is your answer. Media queries is the way that it's done. Uh, we used to have a separate external uh, print style sheet with your print styles on it. You can still do that. Or you can actually use the media query and set it up to do um, print styles as opposed to screen styles. That's the other way of doing it. Uh, and you're just going to have to override whatever it is you want overridden. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Let's do. Right. Let's do. Let's do one final. One final one for the road. Sure. Um, Zachy has a question. Uh, do you know what causes white lines in perfectly aligned vector shapes? No. Okay. I don't either. I don't know what that is, but <laughs> I thought really you may. Yeah. It's pretty, yeah, pretty, a very specific question, but there you that go. That is a very specific question. <laughs> uh, so. I would look at padding. I'd look at margin. I'd look at your original vector image and make sure that there's nothing that's mistakenly coded in it. Uh, put a border on it. Put a background color on it. See if you can find where exactly that white line is. Those are all techniques that you can try as you track it down. But I don't know off the top of my head where you would find it. Cool. Okay. I like the border and background tips. Those are definitely tips that I picked up to align stuff and do stuff. It's like you got to know the container that it's in, and that's the best way to figure out exactly and how big it is. Is it this big? Yeah. Or is it this big. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Well, this has been super cool. This yeah, has been let's awesome. Some book links real quick before we get out of here. I want to. Um, he's got a book out. Let's just rep that real quick. I think that's important. Yeah. For you. Let me. Uh, let me yeah. see. Yeah. Oh, and you before have a copy there. Look, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let me. So if you guys uh, are out there um, getting ready to start a product before you write code, read this book. <laughs> so you know, like I'm going to buy it today, um, and just and I think that's uh, that's what you should do. Thank you. Yeah. So it's on Kindle paperback. I think it's on Amazon. You can go get it. And we may have some links out in the in the YouTube channel for it. Yeah, right? there is a link down in the description below for this yeah. book too. But if you go to Jen's website too, here you can see there's also an Amazon link up here and you can do all the stuff here. So this is the book I was talking about. This is a cool book, Jen, by the way. I like that. Thank you. Cool. Thank Look you. at this. You she sold one already. Glenn bought one. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yes, very cool stuff. Yeah. Um, and you also have links on your website too, as well to um, all of your video work too, right? So there's other stuff yeah. here you can go. Yeah. Yeah. There's some great stuff here. The video front, uh, front end masters stuff and the LinkedIn learning stuff is all here too. Yeah. Take your class at front end masters. I'm probably going to do it. It's probably going to do it over the weekend. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> the advanced CSS layouts, it'll blow your mind. Yes. I'll, I'll give you a, one little hint into it. Just because you start with 12 columns, as you start uh, working, in a, say, in a desktop layout, doesn't mean you have to finish with 12 columns. Right. Okay. Cool. Okay. All right. <laughs> Bootstrap won't let you do that. Bootstrap's always 12 columns. It's always 12. It have to be. <laughs> so you learn that math of 12 real quick, you know, like how many right. do I do? You know, so. Right. Exactly. So, yeah. Cool. So you can go to uh, Jen's website, jenkramer.org. Um, and I will put that down in the video description as well. Um, so you guys can have that down there as well. But it's pretty pretty easy to remember. You got a good URL. <laughs> Thank you. <That's> 
<laughs> they're hard to come by these days. They're yes, they hard are. to come by. A long time ago. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's awesome. uh, Jen, this has been great. I've learned a lot. I think the people here have got, um, definitely got their mileage worth. I hope, um, I wish you all the luck in the future. Stay safe. And Thank if you. you want to come back anytime, just let us know. We'd love to have you back on. So it was really cool. Fantastic. Thanks so much for having me. It's been great. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Jen. Bye, everybody. Good luck, guys. Keep coding. See you on the line. That was super cool. That was awesome. Super, super cool. I super learned something awesome. awesome. Yeah, I learned something awesome today. I'm yeah. gonna go in uh, and play with this. I didn't get a chance to play along with the code pen, so I'm gonna go ahead yeah. and, and do that right. afterwards. I got it working. Okay, awesome. You yeah. got it working. That's cool. Yeah. So yes, thank you, Jen, so much for coming on. This was super good. Right. Um, I know next time I have a CSS problem, I know where to go. All right, <laughs> our wrap up is um, we've got a guest on Thursday. Um, Keytron Evans is coming on Thursday. Um, he's doing hacking, um, and he's um, how to break into cybersecurity. And if you're interested in that, but if you want to look at some Kali Linux and what people use to hack people, ethical hacking, of course, that's what Keytron's yeah. about. Yep. So not unethical hacking. So anyway, yeah. we'll that he's, a, he's a white hat guy. He's talking yeah. about working for companies and looking yeah. at finding um, yeah. uh, vulnerabilities and where people have penetrated systems and that kind of stuff. He has yeah. a cool course too. So it is a good, good, good learning resource too. But we'll be yeah. back tomorrow with yeah. more great stuff. And uh, I think it's we're out of time, Kevin. I think we're out of time. Yeah. Let's let's wrap up. Let's let's do it. Um, yeah. If people have um, if this is your first time here, thank you for coming. We super appreciate you joining us today. Um, and Jen was a super good guest. Obviously, you can go back and watch this again if you want to do that or yeah. code through again. Um, but if it is your first time here, you can check us out on our website. You can go to codefinery.com slash job roadmap. You can sign up for our uh, mailing list there too. If you're interested in the boot camp. You can also go to codefinery.com slash virtual. Uh, we do have a virtual uh, boot camp at the minute, so you can attend anywhere from in the U.S. at the moment. Um, so you can attend our next class that starts July 6th. Yeah, July 6th. I remember 6th, this date for right some after, reason in my mind, yeah. July 6th. <laughs> right after the pool. Um, so, yeah. All right. That's it. Uh, oh, you can join us on Discord, too, by the Let's way. Discord, Discord link is in the description below. Uh, a bunch of you guys did already join. That's awesome. You guys have been putting stuff on there. Um, so that's cool. Um, there's a lot of people chatting on there too about stuff. And I'm sure people right. are talking about build on there as well as we're doing this. That's it. So. Yeah, talk about go watch build now. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. go watch build now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Good luck. Keep coding. See you tomorrow. I'll see you guys tomorrow.